How many of you will be honest with me and honest with the Lord and admit to the fact that you worry? Somebody, some ought to be doing this. But we do. All of us do to an extent. Um, I'm, I, you know, I've done research before on worry, but I've preached on it before. And when you study the medical side of worry, worry causes extreme anxiety. And worry and anxiety leads to stress. Stress physically leads to cardiovascular problems. Stress can cause strokes. Stress, they say that when you are extremely stressed over a situation or a circumstance, that it is harder on your heart than running a marathon. Now some of you are triathlon. Because y'all worry all the time. They say that when you're extremely stressed and worried about things, it is also very hard on your digestive system. And I don't mean to be gross, but it's true. You can get diarrhea from stress and anxiety. It also causes skin problems. I used to, when I was uh, during a transition period once in my life, when getting out of the Navy and coming home, the change was really hard. It was, I mean, it, it was put me in a very stressful situation. I was going to college and taking some college classes and courses. And during that time, I honestly was, I was having, I didn't know what they were at the time, but later I was diagnosed as having panic attacks. I would be sitting there in the classroom and it, to me, it felt like everybody in that classroom was staring at me. And it, man, it, it, you talking about stress. And when I would get extremely stressed like that, man, I'd have acne, pimples would pop out all over my face. And I, you know, and it took me years to realize before I ever studied it and looked it up and everything, that it was caused, the acne and stuff was caused due to stress and nervousness. And that's what stress does. It works on your nervous system also. And so, first I can tell you, and, and you know, and telling this to people, it, you know, most time it goes in one ear, right out the other. Just like, you know, anybody's mom ever used to tell you, I tell you something, it goes one ear and out the other. And my daddy used to say, no, it didn't even go in the first ear. <laughs> but worrying over circumstances and situations that you have zero control over is crazy. It, it, it makes no sense. If you don't have control, if you can't change the circumstance or the, or the situation, for you to spend hours and days and sometimes months worrying about something that you have no control over is not very smart. And I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle you, but I'm trying to help you this morning. And if you do have control over the situation, change it. If you can change the circumstance or change the situation to make it better, do that. But if you can't change it, don't worry about it. Because it won't help you a bit. My mama worries about, she worries about worrying. Mm -hmm. She worries about everything. Well, God's got a word for us on that. And I want to preach this morning on winning the war over worry. Three verses. Three simple verses in Philippians chapter 4. Starting with verse number 6. 
Paul writing to the Philippian church. And can I remind you where Paul is when he's writing this? He's not put up at the Hilton. He's not sitting around in a bathrobe and drinking and sipping on his coffee and writing this letter out. Paul is in a Roman prison where he had been beaten. It's not a prison like today. These kind of prisons were being like in a dungeon. They'd been dirty and damp, rat infested, possibly snake infested, because usually where there's rats, there's snakes. And so he writes this, and let's just read verse 4 and go on, but I'm, I'm just going to be mainly in 6, 7, and 8. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now listen to these words very carefully. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth, passeth, excuse me, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are uh, excuse me, pure, yeah, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, the Bible has an awful lot to say about our minds and our thinking. I know we put, and we should, uh, we should put most of our emphasis in the church on the fact that Jesus Christ, being the Son of the living God, died on the cross for the sins of the world. That He shed His blood so that you and I could be redeemed while swallowed in the snow. And on the morning of the third day, He rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Ascended to God into heaven, sits at his right hand, making intercession for you and for me. And he is coming back again one of these days. Amen. But we also have to teach. And part of teaching today is this fact. What about your thinking? People spend so much time on what they wear, how they look. Is my makeup right? My makeup's always right. Amen. Woo, yours too, Sue. We, we worry about our shoes and our socks and what kind of shirt am I going to wear? What kind of tie am I We worry about the outside appearance. And I think it's a good, it's a good thing. No, I have no problem with you and I putting a little effort and a little time into our outward appearance. But I'm here to tell you something. God is much more interested on your inward appearance than He is your outward appearance. The Bible says God looketh upon the heart. Man looks on the outer part, God looketh upon the heart. And so we need to understand. I want to, let me just show you something. 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter number 1, I want to read a few verses here. The Bible says in verse 13 of 1 Peter, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as ye which have, excuse me, but as he which hath called you is holy, so ye be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And may I remind you, church, that is still in the Word of God today. Amen. God says, I'm holy. And because I'm holy, and because I've redeemed you by the blood of my Son, you need to be holy. But here's the point. You and I cannot be holy. We cannot get to verse 16 without going through verse 13. 
And verse 13 tells us to gird up the loins of your mind. Now, you say, well, what exactly does girding up the loins of my mind mean, preacher? Well, you know, you go and you'll study the Bible when you go to the Ephesians and you look at the armor of God, it talks about the loins, that we're to put the belt of truth around the loins. Now, when you study the loins and you look at what it means, and, and, and I'm going to be sweet and nice about it, it means the private parts of your body. Now, when he discusses that, that we are to gird up the loins of the private places of our body, here in 1 Peter, he tells us to gird up the loins of our mind. Do you think possibly that what Peter was talking about is those private thoughts that you have that nobody else knows about but just you and the Lord? And he says you need to get your thinking in line with God's word. You need to get your, your thought pattern and your thought process needs to be in accordance with God's word. It's like this. Your ears and your eyes are the gateway <coughs> to your mind. What you see and what you hear affects a whole lot of what you think. Amen? Am I telling the truth there? So what we put in is going to be what you get out. You know, people talk about this, say, well, my computer's messed up, preacher. Can you come help me with my computer? I don't know what happened to it, but it's messed up. I'm telling you what happened to it. You messed it up. You say, well, what did I do? I, I don't know what you did, but you messed it up. You say, how do you know that? Because the computer don't mess itself up by itself. If, a computer, if you hit the wrong key, I mean, Sandra's done it. I mean, now Sandra can do, she's graduated a lot. But I remember when we first got a computer, Lord of mercy, every few minutes, Wes, <laughs> come in here. I don't know what I did. And, you know, I mean, Chelsea come down the house when she was young one time. And she, I don't know what that child hit, but she hit some button. And, you know, down at the bottom where it's got your taskbar and all that stuff, it ended up over here on the side. And I'm like, what did she do? And it took me a while to figure it out, but I finally figured it out and fixed it. And I told her, I said, don't do that no more. I don't know what it did. So in other words, what goes into the computer, the computer only puts out what is put into it. Well, your brain and my brain is the same way. What we put in our mind, what we put in our brain is what comes out. And so he gives us an example of what we ought to think on, what we ought to put in our brains. In verse number 8, when he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, the things that are truth, and what is truth? Jesus Christ and His Word is truth. But yet we'll spend more time reading magazines and articles on the Internet and on social media. We'll spend more time reading that than we ever do the Word of God. And Paul says, put the Word of truth in your mind. He said, not only that, but think on things that are honest. Well, that cuts out all of Washington, D.C., I mean, if you want to put something honest, don't listen to the politicians because they're not going to they're going to tell you what they want you to hear or what they think you want to hear. Amen. He goes on and he tells us that whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. He said, put pure thoughts in your mind, not unpure thoughts, not untruthful thoughts. He goes on and tells us. He said, think on those things that are uh, of good report. And if there be any virtue, which means power, and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, I mean, it amazes me that people who watch junk on TV can't figure out why they're lusting over women out there. Because you watch junk on TV and it goes in your brain, gets a good resting place, and Satan takes that and he uses that to his advantage to get you, to seduce you and to get you out of God's will. So, you see, you're going to preach on worry, preacher, the women, the war of worry, exactly what we're going to do in the next few minutes. Verse 6, 7, and 8. Mainly verse 6 and 7 is my points. I've got three points, two of them out of verse 6, one out of verse 7. So, how do I win the war over worry? Now, number one, you're going to have to make up your mind you want to win the war over worry. That's like losing weight. You can't lose weight 
because somebody else wants you to lose weight. If you're going to lose weight, you're going to have to want to lose weight. If you smoke or dip or chew or smoke a pipe or cigar and you somebody, your wife nags you, quit, 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 quit. You might try to quit, but you ain't going to quit until you want to quit. You've got to make up your mind, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to quit it, and when you decide you're going to quit it, that's how it's done. You know what that's called? Setting a goal. So the first point in verse number 6 is the goal that we should set. The goal that we should set is the first words, be careful for nothing. The word careful there is translated, if you have a new King James or some of the other newer versions other than the King James, it's going to tell you anxious. Yeah. Be anxious for nothing. The word anxious, coming from the Greek word, that is one of the meanings, uh, one of the other meanings for it is worry. Don't worry about nothing, he tells us. But yet we seem to worry about everything. I mean, I don't want you to raise your hand, but you can give me a smile because everybody's looking this way. How many of you have a hard time sleeping at night because you're worried about something? I see a few smiles, a few grins, a few, I ain't telling you, preacher. <laughs> but that's, that's, I mean, I have, most of the time, you can ask Sarah, most of the time when I go to bed at night, I lay down, I read my our daily bread, I say my prayer, I put it in the MP3, and I, most of the time I've got some good Christian music playing. Sometimes I'll record some preachers and play some preachers. Man, usually I don't hear a song, maybe two at the most. And I'm snoring. I'm out. Most of the time the preacher don't even get to his message. He just reads and prays. And by the time he gets done praying, I'm already... I mean, I go to sleep really, really quick. Sandra tells me, and most of the time when I get up in the night to go to the restroom, she goes, I think you're sleepwalking because you come back to bed by the time your head hits the pillow, you're already snoring again. And that's me. I, 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 go, to sleep. I go to sleep peacefully. But I do know this. The, the nights that I got something on my mind that's bothering me, it takes forever to go to sleep. And can I get an amen? amen? Anybody else know what I'm talking about? There's nights that you lay down. There's, there's, there's times that you put your head on your pillow. And man, I'm telling you, the gears start turning and you start thinking about what's happening and what's going on. The doctor's report, the financial report, the family report. All this is happening and you just cannot get yourself to go to sleep. Sometimes it keeps you up at night. Sometimes you worry during the day about things. He says very simply, be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Let it go. Like that song in that movie, let it go, let it go. And that's what we need to do. Don't worry about things you've got no control over. Set a goal. Your goal should be every morning that God allows you to get up. Every morning that you can get out of your bed, put your feet on the floor, you are to say, God help me today not to worry about anything. Don't let me worry about my boss. Don't let me worry about my finances. Don't let me worry about my car. Don't let me worry about my house or my health or my family. Lord, don't let me worry about these things. And set that goal so that every day you repeat to yourself, Lord, help me today as my goal not to worry about things. And Paul didn't say don't worry about some things. He says don't worry about nothing. In essence, Paul says nothing in the world is worth worrying about. Let it go. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's the first point. The first point on winning the war over worry is the goal we should set. Be careful for nothing. The rest of the verse gives us the second point. The second point is the guide we should strive to follow. Well, what's the guide that we should strive to follow? Look at the verse. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, and you ought to, in your Bible, if you mark it, you ought to underline the word everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. 
but in everything. That sounds like a pretty good guide to follow to help you not to worry. You need a guide in this situation. Can I ask you who is your guide? The Lord. The Holy Spirit. Does the Bible not say He will guide you into all truth? We need to let the Holy Spirit be our guide. And when you read this verse, He gives it to us very plainly. In everything. Now, He didn't say in most things. He didn't say in the majority of things. He said in everything. Not just a few, not just the little, or not just the big, but all things, he says. But in everything, by prayer. Pray about it. You know, the first thing that most people do in these days, now some of you, I know this ain't your thing, but for the majority of America today, this is it. If I get a bad doctor's report, if I lose my job, if my wife leaves me, if, if something happens, before I ever get on my knees and go to the Lord about it, well, I've got to post that. I'll post that on Facebook, and I don't want everybody to know, poor little me, look what's happening to me, look what I'm going through. And we spend more time doing that, or we'll call somebody. And we'll report to them, guess what happened? Guess what I heard? Guess what happened to me today? Guess what the doctor told me today? And we just pour it out to anybody and everybody. But the verse says, but in everything by prayer. Now when I pray, I love you, Tony, but I don't pray to Tony. I don't pray to Leonard. I don't pray to my wife. I don't pray to Muhammad, Buddha, or anybody else. When I pray, I say, Heavenly Father, I pray to God. And so what he says in these two verses, in this verse here, is don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. That's a good motto, isn't it? Worry about nothing, pray about everything. He says, but in everything, prayer. Take it to God in prayer and in supplication with Thanksgiving. Now how many of y'all, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, I've got some bad news. You've got this situation in your life and it's going to be hard, it's going to be rough, you're going to have a hard road to hoe. How many of y'all go, well, thanks, doc, I appreciate that. <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> I mean, most time we'll argue with them. You're wrong. I mean, it, it took Brenda over a year to finally say, okay, I'll have surgery. I'm telling on you, lady. <laughs> but you know, you go in and, and we were talking to somebody yesterday, Sam was talking to somebody yesterday and they were talking about a situation and a problem and Sam said, well, you need to get that checked out. You need to go to the doctor. Well, I don't want surgery. But that may be the answer to fix the problem but she didn't want surgery. And that seems to be our way. So most of the time, if you go to the doctor and, and the doctor tells you, well, now I hate to tell you this, but you're diabetic. You're going to have to go on shots and insulin. You know, well, thanks, Doc. I appreciate that. I've been looking forward to going on shots. <laughs> I've been looking forward to sticking that needle on me every single day. I, you just made my day, Doc. That's not the kind of Thanksgiving he's talking about. It's not, thank you, I lost my job. Thank you, I got health problems. Thank you, honey, for leaving me today. I mean, that's not what he's talking about. It's talking about having a thankfulness in your heart to know that God who sits on the throne in glory has all things in His control. He is the creator of all things. He has power over all things. And if the doctor gives me a bad report, I have to say this. God, you've got something going on. I may not understand it. I may not even really like it, but I'm thankful to know that you're in control and you got it going on. Amen. That's what he's saying. So when he says this in this verse, but in all things, he says, he, he said, be, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto social media. Mm -mm. 
<laughs> that ain't what it says. But isn't it amazing? Do y'all ever get, any of y'all that's on Facebook and whatever else is out there, do you ever get on that thing and think, this people have nothing to do but get on here and whine to the whole wide world about their situation and their problems? I think that, I mean, honestly, sometimes I, I scroll through and I'm like, what is y'all's problem? And I mean, really and truly, I, can I just be real honest with you? You and I all ought to drop Facebook like a hot potato. And the time that you spend on Facebook, spend it reading and praying to God Almighty. What, think about it. What a change it could make in our lives. You say, well, preacher, I'm only on there 30 minutes a day. Well, how much during the day do you pray? And how much during the day do you read your Bible? You say, well, probably not 30 minutes. There you go. So he tells us that, you know, we can be careful for nothing. Set the goal to follow. I'm not going to worry about it. Then he gives us the guide that we should follow when he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the third point is this, verse 7. And in verse 7, we see the gift we will sustain. And the peace of God, which path, path all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now stop for a minute. I want to ask you a question. It is not a trick question, hand of the Lord. It's not a trick question. It's a simple, simple question. Can you just say these words? I want to go to heaven. Are you going? Just by saying, I want to go to heaven. The answer is no. There's a process, is there not? Yes. The process is you've got to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to convict you of your sins according to the Word of God. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sins, and this is the great thing about God, He never does something like convict you of your sins. He never does anything like help you set a goal without giving you a way to obtain that goal. Everything that God points out, you need to do this. He gives you a remedy of how to do it. And so when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you that you're a sinner, the Holy Spirit also shows you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that He is your remedy to get to heaven. No way can you go to heaven but by Jesus Christ. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, He convicts you. He shows you your need of a Savior. When you bow your head and say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I'm a sinner and I don't deserve heaven, but I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Please save my soul according to the Word of God. When you do that and you confess Him as your Lord and Savior, His Spirit comes in, takes over, and you are born again, bought by the blood, Bible-believing Christian on your way to heaven. That's how you get to heaven. Yes. If I sit here right now and say, I think I want to go to Boone and eat lunch today. That doesn't mean I'm going to Boone and get eating lunch today until I do what? Get my keys, get my car, drive up there, and then I can go eat lunch. I can't, I can't just in my mind go eat. I'd be pretty hungry at the end of the journey, wouldn't I? <laughs> and so what I'm saying is you can't have the peace of God that passes all understanding, which keeps your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. You can't have that by just simply saying, I want it. There's a process in this. The process is verse 6 and 7. The process is you need to set a goal. And that goal is, I'm not going to worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. Set the goal. When you set the goal, then you must follow the guide. And when you set the goal and follow the guide, then you can redeem the reward which is the gift of the peace of God that passes all understanding. That peace of God that passes all understanding so far passes and surpasses the world's peace that even we as Christians can't even really explain it. That's how Paul, Paul's like, I know Paul's a highly educated man. Had been to 
doctorate school, had all the degrees, theological seminary degrees. He knew it. He had been spent time in the presence of God in heaven. God spoke to him here on earth. He had the power of God all over him. And when it comes to talking about the peace of God, all he could say is it just it's so great it passes anything you and I can think about. And if you've ever experienced that peace that passes all understanding, you'll give a thumbs up. Ditto. I agree. I don't know how to explain it, but it is real. That's how when you can go sit at your doctor's office and the doctor says, I hate to tell you this, but you've got cancer. It looks like you're going to die in about six months. Yeah, there's going to be a part of you that's going to go, oh man, I'm going to leave my family. But then I'm going to think, I'm going to get to go see Jesus. I'm going to have no more heartaches, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more crying anymore. Sounds pretty good to me. Thanks, Doc. Yes. And that Doc's going to look at you like, I think I better give this person a crazy pill because they're a little crazy right now. But the truth is, <coughs> it is the Holy Spirit pours out the peace of God upon your heart. When you go through the funeral of a loved one, I know it's hard. It's very difficult. And we weep and we cry and we mourn. But can we all be honest? It's usually about us. When my dad cried, when my dad died, I cried. I didn't cry for my daddy. Because my daddy stood, stood up in church many a times with his lip a trembling, thanking God for saving his soul. My daddy was faithful to the church. He, he, he loved his family. He loved the Lord. He loved the church. I believe more than anything in the world, when my daddy closed his eyes in death, he awoke in God's new heaven. I believe he was with Jesus Christ in paradise. But when I cried, I didn't cry for my daddy. I cried for me. And so when the doctor tells you that and you go through some situation of a funeral and it's hard, I know it's hard, but I'm here to tell you I've seen God pour the peace of God that passes all understanding on my heart and other folks' hearts during those times that just passes. You can't even explain it. But the only way you can get to it is to go through a goal and to follow a guy in order to receive the gift. And so he says in the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ or through Christ Jesus. The word keep means to set a guard. And let me explain it like this. Um, let me see if I can find this verse I want to share with you in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, Let your conversation, now we've discussed this before, the word conversation in King James means your lifestyle. He says, Let your conversation, get back to my place, be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. You see, that gift that he's talking about there, in Philippians 4, in verse 7, that gift is the peace of the Holy Spirit that moves into your hearts and your minds, and the Bible says He will keep, He will guard your heart and your mind. Have you ever heard anybody say this, or maybe you said it? I love you with all my heart. You ever said that to anybody, or anybody ever said that to you? Those are words of what? Emotion. I love you with all my heart. So the Bible is saying that God's going to set up a guard over your emotional system if you'll set the goal and follow the guide. You receive the gift and that part of that gift is the peace. And with that peace comes a guard that He sets over your emotional system. What do we worry with most of the time? Emotion. She broke my heart. He broke my heart. Oh, they don't like me no more. They mistreat me all the time. Why in the world, you know, why is everybody always picking on me? 
Remember that, that show, uh, Hee Haw? <laughs> if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. <laughs> Gloom, despair, and agony on me. That's the way some people talk a lot, you know. But he doesn't just say that he's going to keep our hearts, but he says he's going to keep our hearts and our minds. Your mind is what you think with. Your mind is the motion, uh, is, is the part of you that dictates choices, decisions, moods, because it, it, it's, mo it's mainly in your mind on what kind of mood you're in. You ever been in sort of a state of uh, between here and there? You ain't happy, you ain't sad, you're just kind of in the middle. Somebody comes up around you, and man, they're just void, filled with joy, and they start la laughing and joking, and next thing you know, you're laughing and you're joking, and you went from the middle to the good side of life. But then you can be in the middle and somebody come up and man, they start pouring on you all the boo-hoos in their life and how life treats them so awful and how everything stinks in their life. Next thing I know, your life stinks and you're being treated awful too. You just follow right along with them. But God says, if we'll follow, if we'll set a goal and follow the guide, we receive the gift of peace that passes all understanding which will guard your hearts and your minds. And like I said, when you go down to the end of verse number 8, he says, think on these things. How's your thinking going today? Let me close it with a little story. I read a story one time about these two artists. Both of these artists were asked to draw a painting or to paint a painting of the most peaceful scene that they could put into their mind. The first artist gets up and on his canvas, he gets his paints out, he begins to brush the top part, and the top part was the beautiful sky. After he finished it, there was no clouds, beautiful sunshine. I mean, the birds were flying through the air. Then he gets down, he, plant, he paints the trees, the trees are all so beautiful. Then he comes over here to this side over here and he paints this beautiful little cabin. And on the porch of the beautiful little cabin, there's an elderly couple that's been in love for 52 years. And they're holding hands and they're sitting there rocking back and forth on the porch overlooking a beautiful little pond. And the little beautiful little pond is just, the water's just soft and, I mean, the most perfect painting he could paint of a peaceful scene. When he got done, he looked at it and he thought, man, I did good. The second artist comes up. He begins at the top also. As he paints the top, it, it's kind of black and the clouds are looking pretty mean, ominous clouds, you know what I mean? And then he comes down and it's like raining and the wind is blowing and everything's all messed up. He paints the side of a mountain and there's a waterfall coming over the mountain and, and he, he just paints the crevices and the clefts of the rock and the water that's blowing and how the water's just... All, and when he got done, the first artist looked at him and said, Buddy, he said, you know, I don't mean to, to be critical, but we were told to paint a peaceful scene. I don't see much peace in your painting. The second artist said, you need to get a little closer to it. So the first artist, he, he gets up a little closer and he begins to look and something catches his eye right in the middle of the painting. <coughs> and right in the middle of the painting, where he painted the clefts of the rock, there's a bird, mother bird, that's in there feeding some worms to her baby birds. In the cleft of the rock, during the storm, during the rain, during the wind and all that's happening, and the mother's in there feeding her little birds and her little birds are going, tweet, 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 tweet. And he said, see, it's not the avoidance of the storms that brings peace to me. It's the peace in the midst of the storm because the bird was held, was hidden in the cleft of the rock. And we know from the stories of the Bible that the cleft of the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. That when we go through storms, and we will go through storms, we will have troubles and trials in this life, but when we go through them, when you've got Jesus Christ who says and, and Chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It gives you peace that passes all understanding. 
So my question for you today, how's your thinking? Because if you're thinking on things, you shouldn't be thinking on. If you're looking and listening to things you shouldn't be looking at and thinking of and listening to, I'm here to tell you very seriously, folks, you can't have the peace of God that passes all understanding. You need to set the goal that I'm not going to worry about those things no more. I'm going to let it go. And then I'm going to follow the guide. And because I follow the guide and set the goal, God said, I'll give you the gift, the peace that passes all understanding. Would you please stand to your feet? Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're just going to this morning.